In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air in Lion's Gate, the fair. There's the recording button. Recording has now started. Thank you. Strong, brave, fierce, true. Her Excellency Gemma Delaroche from the Shire of Danescombe is never one to shy from injustice. Her arts and science talents and dedication have earned her many accolades, including a Jean de Leon in 2003, Avocal's ANS champion in 2009, and both an Etoile d'Argent and entrance into the Order of the Laurel in 2013. Her knowledge and experimentation in the field of lamp working is legendary. Besides the arts, she is truly a pillar of our game and has devoted her efforts over decades into helping build and guide our game. From running events to supporting royals, from advising to mentoring, her wisdom and humor have helped light the way for many who lead. For example, Her Excellency has over 36 awards of personal service from Avocal to Antio, from Montengard to Thierry. We are so pleased to be able to present Viscountess Gemma today. Okay, flame on. <laughs> okay. And um, so, wow. Um, hi. Uh, how about we start with what lamp working is right off the bat? So, I have submitted some paperwork in case any of you are interested and want to have a little handout. Uh, so, that's there. It's up online as far as I understand. Uh, we'll cover everything in this so don't feel like you have to have it if you don't want it it's not mandatory you don't yes apparently it's on there um it it's not mandatory to follow along for the evening it, it, it will be very easy if you'd like to ask questions as long as the torch is not on i can hear you fine please feel free to just jump in with questions and that'll be just good with me i'd like to keep this really informal and conversational if that's okay with everyone here uh, during the time that we're working on the torch, um, I'll, I'll walk you through it. You won't be able to see exactly what I see strictly because I have a set of Dididium glasses that I'll be wearing over my glasses, which allow me to see through the sodium flare, which means nothing to you right now. But when we turn the torch on, what that will be will be the big yellow bushy part that you see that I won't see. So I'll be able to see more of the working area of the thing. Are we good so far? Anybody? Beautiful. So if you don't know what lamp working is, uh, it's a glass form that is thousands and thousands of years old. Uh, it, it's been everywhere. Started in some people's minds in Africa where they did sand casting with it. But you can find glass beads as trade beads throughout the entire history of the world. Uh, we're going to use the term lamp working, which is uh, a little bit more historically correct instead of flame working, which is what modern um, artists call it. It's essentially the same thing, it's just semantics. So we'll start off with the equipment list. Having trouble loading it. Zodi uh, Her Grace is having a hard time loading the document, but she'll get there. So we'll start with the uh, equipment because that makes more sense. If we go right into the demo, you guys won't understand what we're doing. So there's a number of different kinds of glass and we're going to be talking about soft glass, which is soda lime glass. It's the most popular glass used for lamp working because it melts at a lower temperature. Uh, it also anneals differently and will cover annealing as well. Oral silicate glass is what is considered hard glass or <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll go with hard glass, it's easier. So it's 
much more resilient. It's harder to work with, melts at a much higher temperature, is used for things like chemical lab equipment. Uh, functional art glass. So things like pipes, bongs, anything that we, you would use in pop culture. So there's that. So we've already had a question about torches and what we're going to do first is I'll show you a single fuel torch. So this is a single fuel torch, which is also called a hothead. You only need to have a small green propane bottle in order to make this work. And you would just attach the green bottle straight onto the torch. There's only one controller. And so this knob only controls the amount of propane that goes in and out of the torch. The small holes in the torch are what introduce the oxygen into the flame, which make it warm enough to melt the glass. Uh, this is a fantastic beginner's tool. They sell for about $70 now. They're easy to get. I have a reference or I have a web link that I can give you online later for France Glass, which is where I buy all of my stuff because um, best prices, best shipping, great selection, hothead torches. What I'm going to use today though is a dual fuel bench miner torch. So all that means is that it requires a propane tank and an oxygen concentrator or bottled oxygen. Bottled oxygen isn't really safe, so I don't recommend it unless you happen to have a permanent place that you can work in where it can be secured to the building. We're not gonna worry about that. Um, so this torch, I can control how much propane or how much oxygen is brought into the torch head itself, which allows me different technique abilities so I can control how hot or how cool I want to work, how big or how small the flame is that I want to work. Um, it's a much more expensive setup too though, because it requires welding hoses and tanks and regulators and that sort of thing. So this is not a good way to start. This is, this is not a beginner set. Okay, so the equipment that you need to get going. This is a naked mandrel. A mandrel is essentially a chunk of steel, stainless. Go on. Pardon? Let's go. Okay, so this is a mandrel. They're also known as bicycle spokes if you don't want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> this is a mandrel that has been dipped in bead release. If you put hot glass on the naked mandrel, on a hot naked mandrel, you will never get the glass off. Then it becomes a hair stick or a plant pick. I have lots. This one, the not naked mandrel, has been dipped in bead release, which is a mixture of silicone, pottery kiln release, and diatomaceous earth. Um, and that doesn't really matter to you guys at all, unless you plan on making your own bead release. And let me tell you, if you do, you're gonna end up with about 20 years worth. Ask me why. So instead, you can buy it in a tiny little bottle that will last you for years and years because you can reconstitute it if it dries up. So this is probably $15 when I got it. And I probably had it for a decade. And it's still mostly full. So some of the things that you need to get started with are going to be quite expensive, but amortize over the long term quite well. And some of the things that you're going to purchase, like your glass is going to be a capital expense and you're just going to go through it left and right. But that is what it is. So this is a not naked mandrel with a bead on it that I made right before class. Normally I wouldn't recommend showing them to you in such a short period of time, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like when the bead is actually on the mandrel and hasn't been released. And then I'll show you. We won't. Nope, nope we won't. I won't show you how well the bead release works because it won't come off right now. 
normally what I do when the beads are done and they've been sitting in my kiln for a while is I take them into the house and I put them into a sink full of water. The water releases all of the bead release off it, seeps into the bead release that's between the mandrel and the bead, cracks it, and then you can spin the bead off. That bead has not been soaked, so that's probably why it's not coming off. Anyway, I digress. Um, if you're going to be really, really serious about this, you can purchase a kiln, which I wouldn't recommend for anyone until you've made an, an ongoing commitment to this because it's a lot of money. Instead, what I did when I first got started is I had a crock pot full of vermiculite and I would set the beads into the vermiculite when I was done making them and I would leave them overnight. The longer that you let the beads soak, the more you're going to allow the glass to realign the molecules in it so that they're strong when you take them out. You can also get bead, oops, bead soaking beads. Um, and so these are essentially, burr, burr, burr. Uh, there you go, yep. Okay, so these are annealing bubbles and they're really, really quite affordable. Uh, I think two bags of them cost me about $20. Again, you can get them from France Glass online. Um, and they work amazingly well. They're lightweight. You can take them with you anywhere because I just put them into a Ziploc bag if, I, if I'm teaching away from home. Super easy to take care of, require nothing. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can get a fiber insulation blanket and you can soak your beads in there. So when I'm using hard glass, borrow glass, which is hotter than, you have to work hotter than with a soft glass, I use the fiber blanket um, because it's a little bit easier. I just pick up one end, shove the beads in, put it back down, call it good, walk away. Same thing, 24 hours if possible. Okay, this is where you get to have a little laugh. Didanium glasses allow you to see the flame, the flame that you want to work in. So I'm going to see essentially the tip of a blue cone that looks like this, and I'm gonna work above it when I start to melt the glass. What you're going to see is this big bushy yellowish orange flame, and you won't be able to see into that because you don't have the glasses. The glasses are what cut the soda flare. So, you can either get a screen that sits in front of the torch and allows you to see through so that you don't have to wear anything. And I have one of those, but I find that the arm for the screen gets in my way and then I can't get my arms in there and it gets distracted. Or you can get a pair of these bad boys because nothing looks better. But thank God somebody got nicer about it and came up with some little sexy ones. So I wear the little sexy ones, but because I also wear prescription lenses, I have to wear them over my prescription lenses. So if anyone tells you that this is a sexy art, they're telling you the truth. It's hot and it's sexy until you look at the accessories. Any questions? We good so far? That's a needed, right? Those glasses are a needed. Yeah, you know, the thing about them too is that there's a lot of people who go into glasswork and don't use them, but the soda flare and the UV that the, that the flame throws off is actually really bad for your eyes and you can get what they call glass workers eyes. So the big ugly pairs you can get for $10, $15. Um, and I can't even remember what I paid for the little ones, but because they're so much lighter than, they, than the big clunky ones, they were worth every dollar for me. But yes, I would say that you should definitely have them. You could also, if you don't want to pay for the uh, didymium glasses, because as soon as you start to get into anything that's specialized, you can go to Princess Auto and buy welding glasses. They will also work. It, they're not identical, but they will work. So then we talk about marvers. Marvers are a shaping tool. Um, and this one is an aluminum marver. You can see that it's got grooves in it. So depending on which way you run your bead over it, it'll put the grooves into it. Um, a lot of people will also make their own homemade ones for things like melon beads and whatnot. 
Um, and I have one that was made with a block of wood and some razor blades. Now that one's really dangerous and I don't suggest you do that. Uh, aluminum is your friend. And you can get them in all different um, sizes so that if you want to make really big beads, really big beads, uh, but have those ridges further, further apart, then you can get those and you can also get them when they're closer together. So that's a Marver. This is graphite paddle. Graphite paddles are your best friends. Uh, so on a hot head torch, you will not have a built-in graphite marver, but if you have a dual fuel, you'll have a built-in marver, and I use mine all the time. But I love these little things. This particular one has a notch in the top so that I can rest a mandrel in it, like so. Um, it's also got a little notch in it so that if I want to work and hold my mandrel, I can work there. I've never made that one work for me because I don't have enough hands to make that work. So I'm, I'm sure someone out there can, uh, but I have probably one, two, three, four. I have five different uh, graphite tools on my bench pretty much all the time. I would show you my bench, but from what you can see, you can sort of see a mess. That's what it generally looks like. It's not that exciting. So then we also have graphite molds. So this, is a, this side of the mold would give you a nice rounded finish. This side would give you more of a diamond type shape. This again is a marker. So it would give you much more in the way of ridges. And then I, there, I've got ones with discs. That one's a flat boring one. That one is also a flat boring one. And then this is a marble mold. So if I want to make marbles, it's much easier than trying to shape them just by hand and by eye. So that's what that looks like. And then we've got things like reamers and tungsten picks. So reamers are anything that you can use to make a big hole in a bead. Uh, holes, holes in beads can be used to make things like bubbles. So if you wanna have a bubble effect, you could use this. The other end is a rake and we use that to make designs and textures. This is a tung tungsten pick. Now hot glass won't stick to tungsten, which is why tungsten picks are, are really, really popular. Um, really, you can do anything with this tool that you can do with the tungsten pick so long as you use water. So all I do is I keep my non-tungsten uh, equipment in a jar of water, and then I take it out when I need it, poke the hole or do the raking, pop it back in the water. Any glass that might have a comp, uh, accumulated on it will go into the glass, into the water in the glass and shatter off. So they still stay clean. The last three tools that I find I can't actually live without are hemostats because they hold your shorts. So, uh, I think I got my hemostats because I worked in a clinic and they were junking them and I took them and it was wonderful. So I don't actually know where you can get hemostats. You might be able to get them online at the glass supply stores, uh, tweezers. Uh, these particular, this particular pair is a pair of glass tweezers and I did pay glass tweezer price for these. Um, but I do have glass tweezers that are not glass tweezers but I use extensively that came from Princess Auto, I think. And last but not least, your knife. I'm positive this came from Value Village and I use it for everything. I use it for shaping. I use it for making ridges and melon beads. I use it for folding glass over, for making curves. And I'll probably bet you I paid a dime. So big investment on the knife, but you'll love it. If you can't get tools at Princess Auto or you don't have anything like that available to you, this is from my dentist assistant. And a lot of them are more than happy to hand that stuff off to you once it's been retired for use and they can't use them anymore for medical work. Uh, so legitimately she charged me nothing. 
um, and she put it, put them all through the autoclave and everything. So I didn't have to worry about it. They were hygienic when I got them off I went. Okay, so if you're following along, we're doing great for time. We've covered soft glass and hard glass. Really, the only thing that I'll tell you now about soft glass that you really should know is that there's a number of different manufacturers of soft glass that have glass at a different coefficient uh, of expansion. The technical blurb of that is in the paperwork, and I won't bore you with it here, but essentially what it means is that if you have a COE of 90 in, in one piece of glass, and you have a coefficient of 104 in another piece of glass, you can't use these two together because your bead will split. It'll, it'll pop apart because they're just, they're not compatible. Uh, so if you, if you're serious about this and you really want to get into it, what I did is I had a little case that I kept anything that was a different coefficient in so that I didn't mix them up while I was using them on my bench. Because once you have glass on your bench, it all looks the same and, and there's no way to tell by eye what that coefficient is. And it's a shame that you get to the end of your, your project and you take it out from whatever you've annealed it in and it's in pieces. So try, I try to only buy 104 glass. So here's, here's the benefit of buying only 104 glass. The main manufacturers of 104 glass have come leaps and bounds from where they were when I first started. There was such a limited palette of glass colors when I first started. And now there's, I don't want to say hundreds, but there's probably a hundred different colors. So if there's a hundred different colors, and there's four primary manufacturers who all make a variation of those colors, your color palette now is much more exciting than it used to be uh, when we used to have to try to figure out how to make purple on our own. So for a long time, if you had purple beads and they were pretty, you were the bomb. They were good. Uh, anybody have any questions before I give you a quick demo? Um, I have what's new. <laughs> I have. <laughs> um, so if you, so you've decided to go totally 104. Um, it, what, uh, I do have some boro glass, but I don't ever mix those on my bench. What is the difference between the 104 and the 90? Is it just like, is there more air in one or? Okay, so the 90 coefficient C glass, um, de again, depending on the manufacturer. So let's let's use the two main manufacturers of 90 glass. So there's Devardi glass and then there's bullseye glass. Right. Devardi glass is mass produced in India and a lot of their ingredients are lower quality than what we get here. Uh, and Devardi glass, is so temperamental and it explodes. Oh. So you have to be able to work it extremely slowly and be very patient with it. You can't rush anything. And in a lot of time, uh, a lot of my experience with it, it will devitrify, which means that essentially the color pigments pull apart in the glass and the glass turns uh, kind of smoky gray unusable color because it's not it, your blue glass that you started out with that was beautiful on the rod is now this smoky gray wrecking like chunking popping piece of glass in your hand then and you're not able to get it onto the mandrel and then if you are able to get it onto the mandrel and cool it and anneal it properly there's chances that it's not going to come back to that blue color that you started with right and that's the 90 yeah and then the other manufacturer of the 90 is Bullseye. And Bullseye is a fantastic glass manufacturer. Most people that do stained glass or slumping will have experience with Bullseye or will have used it. Uh, a lot of places like ACAD use it uh, extensively and almost exclusively. 
they have deals. Uh, it's beautiful for that sort of thing. They have a really limited palette. At, when I was still using it, they had a really limited palette. Uh, and it's bullseye glass is very stiff to use. Some glass is like warm honey and it just moves and you can get it onto the mandrels very easily. Uh, bullseye glass is more like cold maple syrup and you're pulling it and you're trying to get it to move and, and you almost have to fight with it the whole way. Um, so there's, there's two extremes in the 90 glass. There's the popping extreme and then there's the, I really have to work this and it's not quite as enjoyable. With the 104, what I like is that you can start with, for example, white is what we call soupy. It's very fluid. It moves very easily. It comes off. It comes off the rod and onto the mandrel with very little work. You have to pay attention to it though because it moves quickly. And then when you get into some of the translucents, those work a little bit harder and a little bit longer. But you get used to that. But what you can do then is you can use them together um, and use. For example, I will use some of those translucents as the base because they're thick and they're slow and they take more heat, then I'll put white over top of it and then I'll put on my color because generally those translucents and that white are going to be much cheaper than the beautiful color that you want to see. So you can make your base bead with the less expensive and the more, um, the stiffer glass and then go forward and do your, your uh, decorating. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I, I see there's eight, eight chat. Does that mean that there's eight people with questions or just eight people hanging no, out? No, you're fine. I mean, I, I had a question. Um, when you're, when you're approaching up, let's say you've got, you're doing something later period or early period. How, how do those colors shift? Do earlier beads have less colors or they're sim more simplistic? How do you kind of, I mean, I guess it's a big question, but just sort of in broad strokes. Uh, so from, from a strictly period standpoint, if you're talking about early, early, early beads, like African, even Norse beads, that sort of thing. Yeah. You have a, you have a much more limited palette than you do in the Venetian period, that sort of thing. Because by the time we got to, uh, Italian beads and Venetian beads and that sort of thing, this has become manufacturing. They've got this down to a science. They can now make vast bats and bats and crucibles of the same colored glass and pull it into rods so that they have the same color often. They didn't have it mechanized like we do now where there's a specific recipe and that will give you cobalt. They had, I put these five things in this pot and I made it hot and it kind of came out blue. That was, so cobalt is ours, blue is Italian. And as far back as when beads started and they started pouring glass into holes in the sand and doing it, you could still get blue, but what shade of blue might be a little bit different this time, very much with dyeing. Maybe there was an extra bug in your bug so you didn't get the same kind of cochineal. So your palette in Norse times, blues, red, green, white, yellow, black, but all of those might vary. So while you've got your six colors, you could still have hues within that, but you'd probably still have that limited six palette. And as it changes, now, now you've got gray instead of just black or white. And you've got orange instead of just yellow or red. So it did grow over time. And now because of the different um, elements that they're putting into the glass, there's, there's metallic glass and clear glass. And there's sparkly, shiny glass. And I don't really know if you can see it, but this is, this is a clear, transparent rod of clear glass. But it's got these tiny, tiny, tiny little flecks in it. But when you make a bead out of them, it almost looks like, like snow, like it's snowing. Or if I put this particular rod over blue, 
It looks like stars in the sky. It's beautiful. So what we can do now that we couldn't we couldn't do in period is is really quite amazing. But again, uh, if you want to just talk modern beads, we can do that at a different time. I'm happy to do that. Too. Did that answer the question? Okay. So more? Similar to the time period question, is there a geographical difference moving from Europe over to Asia and down into Africa? What colors were available and what patterns? Yeah, so the makeup of glass, soda, lime, silica. Those are the three components that are required for glass. Now, if you take sand from the shores of England and you take sand from the Sahara, those are going to have very, very different elements in them. The glass or the sand in England could have a much higher salt quantity. Sahara, probably not so much, right? Uh, I don't actually know what other elements there are in the sand in either of those places, but I do know that geographically this, the mineral content is different everywhere. So depending on where you are, you'll have variations of the color. Potash glass is a good example of that because there's an entire period of later period glass where uh, especially dishes and beakers and whatnot that that was called potash glass and it's a very distinct green foresty green color but it only came from one specific area and it was either germany or england I, don't quote me on that one right now because i'd have to get my books in check but it was unique to that area because of the way that they did logging in that area and when they burnt off the stumps and whatnot, they put that ash back into the soil and then it came back out into the glass. So yes, short answer would be yes. Sorry, you poked the geek. Anything? Anyone? You good? Good. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a quick demo for you. Uh, if you have questions during this part, again, I won't be able to hear you, so just bear with me. I am going to move the paper away just to be safe. I can I can log questions. So if anyone has any questions, just put them in the chat, and I will I will track them. So we're just we're just going to start with a basic bead so that you can see the process of getting the glass from the rod onto the mandrel. And then um, depending on how much time we have and questions and whatnot, we can, we can look about um, playing with that a bit. Maybe some shapes. Can you turn the camera over just a little bit? Oh, there. there we go. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Strikers are the best for starting your torch. If you don't have a striker, I don't use them because I don't like them, but I have a barbecue uh, lighter. Love this super cheap dollar store. Matches are a real a real problem. So all I'm gonna do is all I've got going now is propane. I haven't introduced any oxygen to it yet. So if you have a hot head and you're just starting out, you can you can start with a tiny, tiny little flame if you want. It'll just take it'll take you longer to make. So I'm slowly introducing the oxygen. And you should be able to see that that's changing the composition of the flame. What you probably can't really see is that I have a propane rich mix coming through the torch right now which means that there's more propane than there is oxygen. It's not a 50-50 blend. It's probably about a 
70, 30. And what that does is it gives me, it gives me a really high cone. So there's tendrils down here where the propane is actually burning off. Then there's the hottest area is right about here in the cone. And then this is sort of what we call the fuzzy area up here and on the sides. You can work here if you want to work cold or outside of the flame. Again, if you want to be working at a cooler area, I like to work right about in here, which is the tip of the blue cone when I first get started, because all I want to do right now is just get glass onto the mandrel and then I can turn everything down or move outside of the flame if I want to add decorations. So, Standard blue, this isn't, a, uh, it's not standard. It, it's not a boring rod, it's a pretty rod. So we'll use a boring rod. So this is just, I lied. This is a boring rod of green glass. So we're just gonna make a standard donut shaped bead. And what I like to do is I like to slowly introduce my glass into the torch. You want to do this slowly so that you're not creating a temperature, a huge temperature difference between the glass rod in in, in of, of itself. You don't want to cause a thermal reaction where you have pieces of the glass pop off because you've introduced a cold rod into a really hot flame. So you, I just take my time, introduce it slowly. I can see that the end of the rod is starting to glow and I'm starting to get a a small P-shaped ball on the end of the rod. So I'm just going to leave the rod in there and I'm going to let that grow. I'm turning the rod in my hand so that the glass, which is now hot, doesn't drip off from one end. And I'm going to introduce the dipped mandrel. So we don't want the naked ones, we want the ones that have been feed released. I'm going to move, I'm going to move that into the flame in and out so that it heats the rod. Hot glass won't stick to a cold mandrel. So we want this mandrel to eventually glow a little bit before we start to put the glass on it. And once you've got that, you've got a hot glass, you've got a hot mandrel. At about a 90 degree angle, you want to introduce the glass to the mandrel and roll the mandrel away from you with the hot glass. Now I like to move the glass higher up in the flame and keep only the tip of the glass in the flame so that you're not heating the entire bead that you're creating. You're only heating the glass now. And you're going to go around the mandrel a couple times until you get approximately the size that you're looking for. And then you're going to cut the glass. And all that means is you're going to pull the mandrel and the glass rod away from each other so that the glass becomes disconnected from the rod, which gives you this. And what I want to do now is I want to shape it so that I get the glass more evenly distributed around the, the mandrel, which will give the bead a nicer shape. Now, depending on what sort of shape you want, I just want a simple donut, very straight up regular bead so that I can show you how we did this part. You can shape it just by time and gravity and by hand, or you can use the tools that I showed you earlier. Uh, because I'm not terribly worried about having perfect ends on this and, and making it beautifully distributed around the mandrel, I'm not gonna worry too, too much about that. Um, I'm happy with that shape. I'm happy with the weight distribution for the most part. Uh, you should be able to see it there. Uh, uh, um, unfortunately, I can't get you much closer than this to the torch because it would probably melt my computer. You need to. You can't see it. No. Yeah. There. No. Up. Uh, up. up. Go up. Up. Yeah. Up. There. I am. You're up. Who's up? Up is right. up is there a direction you. I'm not good with apparently. Um, so this is just a straight up green, round-ish bead. Uh, I'm going to put it in the vermiculite so that we see if it actually lives through it. 
you don't want to keep your glass beads outside of the flame without um, cooling them a little bit more efficiently than I did that one. That's okay. Question. Question. When when you were making when you were making the bead, we all we all we saw was the back of your hand. Oh, we couldn't see anything that you were doing, just the back of your hand. So, hold on. <laughs> You could also just do the motions um, in front of the camera. With me, kids. We could, but where's the fun in that, right? Instead, we can just rearrange everything and see if this moves. Oh, yeah. yeah. Much better. Yeah, go a little bit to your right now. Move, move the camera to the right, the other way. This is my right. OK, our, okay. Le our left. <laughs> Our right, your left. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep okay. going, keep going. Oh, good, perfect. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So let's do that again. So I have everything positioned on my bench so that I can reach forward this way and get it without having to reach across and burn myself. That really matters. So if you're setting yourself up, make sure that you can get things from a clear line. So I have a mandrel and we'll use the same color so that you can, it doesn't matter why. So we're gonna introduce it slowly into the flame. So this glass rod is still a little bit warm because we just used it. So it won't take as long to come back up to a melting point temperature. So I won't need to flash it in and out quite as much and I can go much more quickly into creating that P shape that I was saying I created. So, you know, if you really want to pretend that you're doing this and you want to play along, uh, maybe grab two pencils and a tea light and you can pretend. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce the mandrel into the flame. I'm keeping the glass rod above it where it's a little bit cooler. I'm making sure that the, the mandrel is good and hot and starts to glow a little bit. And then at a 90 degree, I'm going to attach that glass to the mandrel, lift the mandrel back a little bit so that the glass stays hot on the, on the rod. And remember that glass, or uh, sorry, heat travels upwards. So we can have a little bit of a tilt on that piece of glass. So we've wound some glass on and now we're going to cut the glass off, which is just a matter of pulling it apart. I like to melt in the little glass pieces that come off the rod so that I don't have any sharp bits so that should I need to grab that glass at any other time when it's cool, I don't stab myself. And now I'm just going to shape it. So it's a little bit top heavy right now. So we're just going to heat that part and see if we can get some of the glass to move. So I'm using the torch marver and I'm just shaping it a little bit. So moving the glass around just a tiny bit. So it's still a little bit top heavy right there, you can see. Um, but again, because it's a demo, we're not gonna worry too much about that. So that's how we get donut shapes and rounds. Good enough, we'll put that one away. So to make two beads, it's essentially the same deal. You're going to introduce your glass slowly. Again, this glass rod is already hot, so we're not gonna worry about that too much. You're going to introduce the mandrel and start to get it warm. And now instead of making a small footprint with the glass when we put it on, we're going to start to wind that bead further down along the rod, expanding it and making it long. And 
and something just dinged, so I don't know if that means that someone's talking to me. So if you're talking to me, just feel free to jump in. What I'm doing too is I'm occasionally turning the mandrel, oh, well, I'm always turning the mandrel away from me, but I'm occasionally turning the glass rod over in my hand so that it maintains heat throughout the entire rod instead of just that underside that's being directly affected. So this is when this marker that, that I told you that I love so much comes in. I would just put that on there gently and move the glass until it made more of the barrel shape that I'm looking for. And whoop, that gives you the barrel shape. And normally then I would go in and I would clean up this end because you can see this end isn't quite as squared off and finished as that one is, but we're not gonna worry too, too much about that. So I'm just cooling it a little bit, trying to make sure that the heat is even throughout that length of glass before I put it into the annealing bubbles. And what I'm doing is I'm just tapping it on the glass just to, to hear it. If you can hear it, the outside coating is sufficiently cooled enough that you can put it away. Uh, okay. And now I'll show you, I'll show you how to make a melon bean, but I'm going to use translucent glass because it moves differently than the opaque glass. So this is also a much thicker rod than I just used. So it's going to take a little bit longer to come up to temperature. Uh, so I'm going to try to hurry that along for you because this part is boring as snot to watch. And we're 46 minutes into this and I would like to thank you all and I would like to say that I haven't sworn yet and um, somebody should write that down. It's probably, it's probably a record. I was really worried about that before we started this. Well, hopefully you do swear so that I can win my bet. You have a bet on how long it takes me to swear? I can neither confirm nor deny that. Well, well what's the pot worth? <laughs> what's my share? There is no pool. So I'm, I'm just trying to speed this part along because you already sort of got the idea of how this part works. It's not the very exciting part. How long does it take the rods to cool down after you've used them? Uh, largely, it depends on the, the glass. Uh, translucent glass takes a little bit longer. And I think that's just because of the chemical makeup. But a, a rod can go back to being uh, handleable from the, the, the previously hot end um, quite quickly, like five, six minutes. Uh, but I still wouldn't, I wouldn't want to risk it because I'm a big wimp. So you can see that we've got a pretty good consistent shape on that one. It's got a good base. It's thick enough that we should be able to move it without uh, having it fall off. So, huh. so we might have a little bit of a problem here because my computer is now sitting on the jar of water that I would normally use for this. So I took the dental pick uh, and I would normally immerse it in water but in this case, I used spit because I didn't have any. And I caused, uh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. I put a dent here, like so. Needs to come up. Whoop, whoop. Um, and that's how you make melons. Uh, you would keep going around the beef, but I don't have any water. So I'm not gonna lick this again because it's already hot. So we'll pretend it looks like this one, which I already had done. So same tool, uh, different color glass, exact same technique, uh, and that's how you make melon beans. This is how you make a mess. 
So here we have some that I've already completed. We have, where are we here? Ah! Yep. Okay, so melon, what? Melon bead. These two are, what the happiness? These two are barrel beads. That's a regular donut bead. I'm, I'm really an amateur at the Zoom thing. So these are beads that were run over the aluminum marber to give different shapes. Um, because these are all part of a commission that I'm working on, they're all vaguely the same shape. Um, this is this is not my preferred shape because I kind of think that these look like bugs. Yeah. And then I already showed you those ones, so ignore that. Then you've got just these are called spacers, and these are just your standard ordinary beads that go between the focal beads and that are pretty. The interesting thing about this particular set, and I don't really know if you can tell from the color, is that they're all from the exact same rods. Uh, and this particular glass is called Painted Hills. And each bead essentially comes out a slightly different color, just because of the chemistry of the rods, how they've done them. And I can see on my screen that they're reading kind of cream color to you. But to me, they're really quite yellow um, and caramelly. So it's really interesting to see what comes out. And then these ones are essentially bicone beads, uh, a little chunkier in the middle, tapered out to each side. This is your standard round. Um, this, is, this is the shape that a lot of people really, really love. Um, and I, I too love it, but I tend to make more donut uh, shaped beads because they were much more common in period. And you can also make them, so this is also a uh, donut bead. It's just really big and decorated. And I'll show you how we do dots in a moment. And then your, your, your paddle shaped bead. And this, I'll, I'll show you how to do that too. That's simply just a matter of pressing a round bead flat. Once you have the weight distribution of the glass kind of occurred. That wasn't confusing at all, was it? Okay, so I'll show you the flat and then I'll show you dots. And then if there's questions, we can do that. Uh, if there's anything particularly that you'd love to see that isn't super time consuming, we can probably have a look at that. So one of the best ways to put decorations onto beads is to buy manufactured stringers. Uh, the thing that I love about manufactured stringers is that they're these tiny, tiny little things of glass, same color as everything that you can purchase. So everything's compatible. Your white is the same as the white that you would use off the big rod. Just comes already extruded into these tiny, tiny little stringer forms. You can also pull stringers. Uh, pulling stringers is hard to get uh, consistency. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I personally don't enjoy it, so I don't do it.
So I want to keep the base speed that I'm working on warm. And where you can see that yellow flare come up right there, that's the tip of the blue cone for me. So I want to work just a little bit further out of that. I want to keep the bead warm, but I don't want to melt it because otherwise I won't be able to attach the glass, the white glass to the green bead without it smearing all over heaven's half acre. And we don't want that to happen. So I just want to heat the tiny, the tip of the stringer and get a small amount of glass melted and apply it to the green bead and then pull away. So again, I'm cutting that. And then th these are the little sharp things that I was saying I like to melt away so that I don't cut myself with them later. So, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna flatten that dot down a little bit so that it doesn't smear all over the place as I go to the other side of the bead and try to put a polka dot on that side. The dots are not equidistant. Um, I'm not going to worry about it. Quite often, what you can do if you get your your dots really, really uneven and they're not equidistant at all, like this one is, you turn it into a triangle, um, and that's just simply pure shaping. So I have four dots on, and if I if I want to be really zazzy, I can put dots on the shoulder as well. And all you're going to do is you're going to find a spot sort of equidistant between the main dots that you put on on the shoulder of the bead and put them there. And I have to apologize if you can hear the magpie out front. It's uh, talking to my cat because my cat has decided it wants to eat the magpie. And now the magpie and all of his friends come over and torture the cat. I feel that's appropriate. So I don't do much about it. So I'm speeding this along a little bit again because it's kind of boring for you guys to watch me do this part but I want to get into the, the stage of the next part. So now that I've got all of the polka dots on, I'm just melting them in enough to make sure that all of that glass is adhered to each other so that nothing's going to pop off randomly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how Norse eye beads were made. So now I'm just melting everything in, making sure that the bead is consistently warm throughout the entire thing. I made a green bead and white polka dots. So I'm going to use a different color on the base polka dots to create the eyes. And because I have it here, I'm going to use this pretty turquoise one. So the glass is pretty evenly heated all the way through. You can see that it's glowing nice and red all the way. And now I'm just gonna move that back to the flame, but at the back of the flame. So where it's cooler, where it's a little bit bushier, we're going to allow the surface of the bead to cool enough that I can work this bead, but I'm not going to lose the shape and I'm not going to amalgamate all the dots into one big splash. The nice thing about your stringers is that they really don't take any time to heat up and melt. So it's a quick process. So you can, I can't really see. You can see we're melting that tiny dot of blue into the white.
that I really, really like about having a surface marber on the torch is that it allows me somewhere to put the mandrel to secure it while I attach dots on the off hand side. So everybody has a side that's their predominant side, their right hand or their left hand. And I'm right handed, so that's my predominant side. So when I when I'm decorating the left hand side of beads, it's much easier if I have something that I can secure it on. So now all I'm doing is I'm just again adhering that those dots that I put on there. I'm going to give it all a quick flash to make sure that the temperature is vaguely the same throughout the entire bead before I show it to you. And then before we put it to bed. So where's the camera? We have made an eye bead and I, I really like these kind of bumpy. Um, so I've left some of the dots quite raised. Um, traditionally and historically, they would be completely melted in. So we'll do that and I'll show that to you as well. Hi, buddy. The dog's here. The dog's not allowed in. So the reason that it takes a little bit longer to melt everything in is, in, is that you now have to introduce heat right back into the core of the bead. And that just takes a little minute. So now you can see that everything is smooth and we've melted them in. And with the exception of the color choice that I've gone with, this would be a perfectly period bead for Norse Viking Celts. Really a number, a number of um, societies. Eye beads, we could put a pupil in this and make them actually eye beads and then pull out the corners. Um, our, historically correct uh, since the dawn of time. And, and this one's actually kind of pretty, so I'm gonna try to pull it properly so that I can save it. It'll be my memento of the first last class I ever taught online and didn't swear in. Oh, <laughs> snot balls. Oh, that was good. <laughs> and I said snot balls, not a bad word. <laughs> uh, Your Excellency, we, we have one question. Is it possible to burn a bead? Yeah, you want to see it? Heck, heck yes. All right. It's not super fun. I'm not really sure what color this is. But it won't matter. Oh, I haven't wrecked something on purpose in a while. Okay, so the other, so what happens when I wreck stuff, um, and again, I can't show you because my bottle, my uh, jar of water is being supporting my computer, um, is I will make, if I've ruined something, or if I think it is so horribly, um, horribly, horribly wrong, that it can never ever be seen in public, um, I will make it really, 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 really hot, and then I will take the mandrel and drop it into a jar of cold water and it will explode. And that is really satisfying. So I'm just making this really hot. And I'm not gonna worry too, too much about the shape because we're gonna wreck it anyway. <laughs> So what I've done is I've moved it right down into the dirtiest part of the flame. And I can see that it's essentially just turning into lava. And now I'm gonna move it out because it's 
really, really, really hot and really, really soupy, but I don't want it to fall off the mantle entirely. And I'm just letting it come down to a temperature where it's gonna be a little bit less malleable. I still want it to be a little bit hot. Mm. Y'all aren't even gonna believe this, but for a bead that we just wrecked, it looks pretty cool. Dang it. So this color, which is that greenish, grayish, nasty, not really a color, but I don't even, can you see it a little bit better now? It's just sort of all smeared and splotchy. Yep. The view that I can see, it, it looks kind of charcoal-y and gray sooty. You can't see anything now, there we go. Uh, this is supposed to be pink. So that's what happens when we wreck a bead. So what I would do is I would then just wreck a couple more so that it looks like this. So it looks like we did it on purpose. And then I'd be like, no, it was a beautiful gray color. <laughs> <laughs> Or I would, what I, what I really like to do with beads that I don't like, um, I have a jar of beads that I call ass glass, and that's not a swear, that's just because that's what I call them. Uh, but I, I like to bury those in the yard so that archaeologists later are like, what? Okay. Um, anyone have any questions or anything? Want to see anything else? Um, I give you a question. Oh, sorry. Did somebody else have one? Oh, I was just going to say you were going to demo making a flat bead. Oh, okay. Um, can my, I, can my, I make a flat bead and then we'll do the question? Sure. But, but that's okay. Linda has a question. Uh, yeah, my question is how do you attach two beads together? Well, depends on what you're doing. We'll, we'll come back to that after we make So I just adjusted it a little bit uh, to make it a little bit hotter so that it doesn't waste so much of your time. Sorry, was there a question about Millefiori? Um, yeah, there's a question. Um, so would Millefiori beads be decorated by bundles of stringers or is it a different technique altogether? Um, wow. That's a, that's a really big question. So the, the quickest way to answer that is, imagine that we take 50 or 60 of the glass rods that I have in my hand and we make the pattern that we want. So we decide that it's gonna have a yellow center and we're gonna make a flower. So we take yellow and we put it in the middle and then we draw out some petals with some red and some blue. And then we want the, the basis of that to be black. So we take our yellow center, wrap some red around it and pattern it until we have sort of a big bundle of glass. And then we wrap some black around that until we have a big bundle of black and red and yellow. And then we heat slowly that entire bundle of glass rods together until it becomes fused and becomes sorry the dog uh, it becomes one large piece of solid fused glass and then you take that piece of glass and between two people you would pull it apart pull it apart uh, so that it becomes very very skinny and often 
a big piece of a big, big, big bundle of glass could be pulled about 40 or 50 feet if your apprentices were speedy. Uh, so that takes it down to the size of one rod. And then that rod is cut into tiny, tiny little slivers. And then those are attached. Um, and I can show you what Millefiori looks like in a minute because I have some here. Um, but when this is done. So we've got a fairly decent shaped bead. It's hot. And in order to make it flat, uh, I want most of the weight to be in the middle. And I'm going to put it on my marver. And I'm going to use my happy little graphite paddle. I'm going to squish it. flat and um, it's it's a little off weight um, and I could fix that if I were really inclined to but again I'm not going to worry too, too much about that what I really like to do with these sorts of beads is I like to turn them into shawna sheets or I like to put little flowers on them and wear them as pendants So putting two beads together sometimes isn't actually putting two beads together. Sometimes what it is, is it's actually making one bead that looks like two. In which case, I would make one bead this long and I would put a ridge in the middle so it would still be attached but it would be one bead. Now, if I wanted to connect these two beads, so I have, for example, a black in the middle, I would make this bead first, I would create a black tube in the middle and attach it there, and then I would make this, this next donut bead close to the end of the tube and connect all three of them together, so you had a white end, a black middle, and another white end. Did that make sense? Do you want me to show you that, Linda? I was thinking more like um, when they make the beads that are like fertility beads and or oh. like a snowman kind of thing or not really snowman that'd be like one two three but okay. I can show you with two though uh, so I'm gonna use I'm gonna use this rod of black glass and pretending we're gonna no I'm not a suspending glass let's go back to using the pink. Um, and that'll maybe give it a better, better visual for you. So there's a couple of ways to do this uh, and neither is right or wrong. It, it's strictly however you like to work. Uh, so if I were making a snowman, what I would be doing right now is I would be working on the, the big bulbous bump on the bottom.
and then I'm going to attach the middle bump. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this area of the this area here where the two beads are going to attach. I want that to be warm, but not super hot. Because I want it to fuse together, but I don't want the bottom bulb that we already made to misshape too, too, too much if possible. So the other way to do this is to make it is to make a tube bead and then just create the balls, the larger areas on that in a taper. Again, depending on what you're what you're attempting. So this is the color that the destroyed bead started out as. So this is kind of pinkish, and the thing that we got was sort of schmutzy, charcoal-y, burnt yuck. So that's how I would make segmented beads. And then if you really, really want, oh, I do it. Really, really want it to make a snowman. I don't really know why, but my snowman's vest is double-breasted, apparently, so he's got four buttons <laughs> instead of three. So, I gave him little eyeballs and apparently four buttons. I don't know what happened with the buttons. But there we go. I kind of like him. He's kind of cute. Anything else? That is amazing that you can just whip up a snowman. That is amazing, Gemma. Uh, well, you know, I gotta tell you quite honestly that that, that is not how I make snowmen. Um, I'm actually trying to see if the one, the one, oh, okay, I'll get you the snowman that I have. Okay. Um. So I went through a, a small phase where um, holidays seem to be the thing. So I have shown the sheets for the holidays because everybody needs a shawn the sheep. And then what have I done? Um, I usually only do frosty faces, so I have a frosty face, and then uh, this is how I normally do snowmen. So they're they're separate beads, and I just do three of them, and then I kind of connect them, but I I leave them 
disjointed enough that their little segments can spin because it amuses me. Um, and I have penguins. Awesome. And then I have like little, this is my, my um, Christmas laurel. So I sometimes wear that one around the holidays. So, so really it's, it's just a matter of what your imagination can come up with and then figuring out how to connect the dots. Because um, I find that um, if I can create it in small bits and make each one of those small bits come up into the finished product, it works a lot easier. Did you make the snowflake beads as well? These ones? Yeah. No, those are from Italy. Those are, these, these ones are cut crystal. Okay. Um, and they were a gift. So, and I, I didn't really have anything appropriate to use them on. I was like, hey, wait a minute. So that's how that came about. I wish I made those. What, um, heat source would have been used in period when you don't have a hot head torch and you don't have a propane tank, what, what would they have used? <laughs> um, often charcoal, if they had it, if, if, if they had a mix of charcoal and dung, you could do almost anything. So um, part of my research when I was really, really, uh, really motivated to see if I could do it is I dug a pit furnace in my backyard and I lined it with mud clay and horse poo and hay. We used charcoal um, and because I wasn't going to use dung because I'm not that dedicated, uh, but I used charcoal and I created a cone over top of it from the clay. Um, and I sat for hours trying to see if I could actually get it to work. And sure enough, like it, it takes time and patience, um, but you can do it just over charcoal, but it has to be hot, 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 hot. And you need to have somebody who will work a bellows for you, or you need to have a fan to continually keep that heat in those coals. That's the way they're still doing it in one small area of Nigeria. Atan can give you all of the information <laughs> on, the, on the African glass beads and whatnot, because she has been there and has lived it. Um, and I only pretend because I have a book in the internet, but she has lived this. So if you have questions about that sort of thing, yeah. please, please talk to Atan. I was wondering, when you mentioned the African beads, the Sandcast, what area were you thinking of? What, did, what area did you mean? Yonder. OK. Because they're, they're not they're not my specialty yeah no in north africa like egypt and that they were but southern sahara there is no medieval beads made there okay uh, so my reference about the sand in the sahara and the sand yeah. in england oh no the sand yeah yeah don't, yeah. don't, don't quote me on that because you'll be yeah wrong. yeah no no the sand thing no but it's it's uh a lot of people think that some of the beads coming out of West Africa are medieval and they're not, they're being made now. Yeah, that's okay. So that's very true. If you're, if you are looking for beads um, and, and you're looking online and you're specifically looking for period beads, be very, very careful that you can find the provenance of them. If you're going to purchase them. One of the, the most reputable beads People that you can purchase um, actual period beads off of is Master Mark de Belfort. Yep. And he has he always has the provenance. Um, and and that's where I've bought mine from. Yeah. Yeah, because pretty well all the so-called African beads are actually made in Italy or in um, the Bohemia um, and were exported. And they were doing it from the 1500s on. Question. Yep. Um, uh, when might I expect glass to shatter or splinter? <laughs> Just now? <laughs> <laughs> that was me throwing one across my bench. Uh, so it, it depends on the situation. 
if I'm going to make, if I'm making a bead and I'm in a hurry and I take that glass rod and it's cold or, you know, room temperature, which is considered cold, and I ram it into the flame and I, I just start and try and work it, there's going to be a thermal reaction in there, that thermal shock, and it's going to, it's going to split or it's going to pop. Uh, but you can have thermal reactions at any time. And depending on how much stress is in that glass that you're using and what you're using it for, like it can happen anywhere. I happened to be in a coffee shop in Banff and the lady went and she poured hot chocolate into the mug and the mug fell off the handle. And she's like, well, I wonder how that happened. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so literally it was because there was a thermal shock between the hot liquid that she put in it. There happened to be a stress at the handle and the mug part where they joined them. And that, that's why it sheared off right there. So it, it depends. Um, a, a good example too of when and how these things happen is sometimes you'll drop a bead or a, let's use a marble, for example. You'll drop that piece of glass onto the ground, nothing. But what's happened then is you've created stress in there and it, that's not something you can see. And so you're not going to be able to predict when it goes. So you might be able to drop that same piece of glass again and it'll be fine. But maybe on the third or fourth time you drop it, that's when it goes, but it will eventually go. That, did that answer that? I was thinking more that when, when you're working it or if you're putting it into water, um, when you can- Oh, anytime you take hot glass and put it into water, you're going to shatter it. Okay. There, there is a technique called chrysling where if you've got a hot, hot piece of glass and you, you oh, you have to be quick, you know, like so quick. But if you dip it really, really quickly into to water, pull it back out and immediately put it back into the flame, and then overlay glass over top of that, what will happen is all of those cracks that you created putting it into the water will be visible through the full um, solid layer of glass that you just put back on top of it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Whew, had to think. Why do, you have, why do you have red fingertips? Because it is my, my homage to being girly. Oh, I thought it was something coating to protect them. No, it's my fingernails <laughs> and I can only commit to that much pink. And that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Over, over the screen, it looked like you had coated your fingertips in like a rubber or something or that to protect them. Oh. Much cooler. It's my homage, it's my girliness. What do you use for ventilation? That is an excellent question. So I, in my, this is my little studio. Um, my husband built it for me last summer. Uh, right, right up there where there's some vases. Yeah. Up there where the light is, there's a very, very large aviation fan in there. I have both windows and the doors open currently. Uh, it's, it's really hot in here right now. Uh, so I prefer to work in the morning and in the afternoon or early afternoons, early evenings. But when that fan is on, um, I, I can't hear you at all. And I'll still have to have the windows open a bit. The door will be closed though. But if the windows are closed, it creates negative pressure and then I can't get the door open. So I can't get out. Uh, you have to have good ventilation because you're sitting over top of gas and it no matter what you do it's going to be off gassing so I have the uh, aviation fan. thank you was outside if you can if you have a hothead and you want to work outside perfect there's a question that's on the on the chat that I thought was interesting it's how do you put a hole in the middle of a, for a button like I'm assuming that you would flatten your glass and then how would you put holes in it? So that tungsten pick that I showed you, I would make that wet and I would take my flat piece of glass and I would make that really hot in that one spot where I wanted to put the first hole. And then I would wiggle that hole through that glass. Um, or, you know, if you really, really wanna be super efficient at it, you can buy button molds. 
and you can you can just manufacture them easy peasy lemon squeezy but you would have to take the um rod out before you do the hole right no if i were going to do buttons i would use much smaller diameter mandrels really? okay so that the bead was this way and the the mandrel would have gone this way but the holes right. go this way correct that looks so wrong i'm so sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i would buy a button mold <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering about technique or if it's possible or how easy or hard that would be to do. I would just buy the mold. Just that mold. Okay. So you can you can buy button molds to have four holes or two holes. Like the mushroom tape, the wire in afterwards. And essentially all you do then is you just melt your glass into that mold. Um, I've only ever made buttons as beads and used beads as buttons, much like they used to use pearls. So. What is I, I, I have a question. If for people that are starting out, what do you think are the, what is sort of the key four, five, six pieces of basic equipment a person needs to make beads? What, what, what's your, what's the minimum a person needs to really try to make a bead? You need a, a torch some some manner of annealing them so that they don't blow up you need glass mandrels and bead release uh, and if you can come up with those five um you're set you're good to go you, you can do this on your you just need charcoal there's a question I the other thing too and i know a lot of uh, the way a lot of people i've known to have done it uh, we have a local lapidary club that lets people come in and glass work is uh, our lamp work at beads are a very popular item. They have all the equipment, they have the glass. You can try it out and see if you like it before you do the outlay. Yeah, I would definitely say that um, if you can possibly take a beginner's course somewhere or find somebody that'll sit down with you for an afternoon, that's the way to go. Uh, because you can buy all of this. You, I think you can buy a beginner's kit, like really rudimentary for about 80 or $90, depending on where you are. Uh, but then if you hate it, you're still out 90 bucks, unless you can sell it. So uh, for in a cup of coffee, I'll probably be bribed to have you over. And that way it's not really costing you anything. Just find somebody that you might want to be able to give, a, give it a go with. What's a Milford bead? A Millefiore bead? Yeah. A Millefiore, Millefiore means uh, a thousand petals so that when they're attached to beads, they often look like something they're not. One second. I have some. It's used in things besides beads too, um, paperweights, um, other other glasswork. Oh, Melifiori is used in pretty much anything that has glass, um, sculpture, art, all sorts of things. So, uh, camera. So this is. I'm trying to get my head out of the way so that you can actually see the flower. Um, this is a a millefiori chip. And what would be done if I were to use this is bef far before I was ready to put this on the glass, I would set it aside on um, a little heated piece of metal. So do you remember when coffee, those little coffee warmer, cup warmer things were, were popular? You could yeah, get them yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So a lot of bead makers use those things because it's perfect. You can put a ton of millefiori on there. They get warm, which you need. You need to have warm millefiori because cold glass won't stick to hot glass. So it would warm up here 
I would make my bead, I would pick it up off the warmer, and then I would, uh, if I had a bead to show you, I would very carefully attach it to this bead and I would wait until they were fused together sufficiently that I could move it away. And then I would start to slowly melt it in. You have to be really careful that you then counterweight the other side of the bead with another piece, or you're going to end up with some awfully blobby looking thing. Or you have to have enough of a pattern on one side so that you can counteract it with a, a, a like a slab of glass on the other side. But that's essentially what Millefiori looks like. And they can be anything. They can be animals, beads, your initials, flowers, all kinds of things. Oh. It's sort of fun that the same sort of technique is used in candy making to make little absolutely like candies with, with uh, flowers and things, candy canes and Santas in them as well. Exactly how they do. Is there, are there glass so, rods that come with the design already in them? Filigrana, as a matter of fact, yes. So unfortunately <laughs> this is and i'm trying to attempt to create three different color were and mashed up in there so um i have i broke it uh, um so i've melted the end together trying to get that to work and if and this way you can see where I broke it. Uh, and I'm really high tech and I put it all together with a uh, twist. Pipe cleaner. Pipe cleaner. Pipe cleaner. <laughs> Thank you so much for this class because it, it, it has helped me. You're welcome. Anytime. Ali. Cleaners are called, I promise. They're called fuzzies um, in the store now. Net patterns and easily yourself. You can take uh, a rod of clear and line your own pattern on it with a color and then pull it out into essentially a string or a rod. So you, you can also create your own. Anybody? I think you're having. Be you there. Be there. I'm still here. Do we have any more questions, comments? Emma, this has been so amazing. I I, I just thought you were gonna sit. I, I just thought you were gonna chat to us. I didn't realize you're actually gonna demonstrate this with live torch. I had my seven year old here for part of it. He was like, "What is going on?" He thought it was amazing. He was wondering why everything was orange. We had to, <laughs> to just explain what was going on. Um, I'm so glad. And now um, we'll have this recording available on the Lionsgate YouTube. But please, like, share it on your, your YouTube stuff. Like, I think, I think this is a great, in, like, a great ground floor introduction to glass bead making. You just did a fabulous job, and I we really, really appreciate you taking Thanks. your time to share with us your beautiful if art. You're if you're interested and you just want to chat, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, ha happy, happy to chat. Uh, Franceglass.com, F-R-A-N-T-Z.com is where I buy most of my supplies. They're out of, uh, and I have been there. So, I mean, like I had my husband drag me across and border me there because I was so excited about it and I just really really wanted to see it for myself and Mike France is one of the nicest men that you'll ever meet and they're so easy to deal with and uh, a really really good book to get if you're interested in actually taking this up is Passing the Flame and the author is Karina uh, and the book has been around forever and ever and ever and I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> plugging this pardon me just because she's my like she's my glass idol but I've actually met her and I spent a day with her in her studio and I I was amazed the the things this woman comes up with hi Linda 
Did you have a question? Still muted. You're muted. Unmute. Okay. There you go. There we are. Sorry, my husband's telling me I've got it's time to go. So we gotta go feed horses and everything. So oh. thank you. This was so awesome. Thank you so much. But later. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Bye. It was great. Okay, so yeah, the book is Passing the Flame by Karina Tettinger. She's uh, and and it is it is easy. She's she's got it broken down so it's super easy to follow and get going. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Well, I send you a big cyber hug because this this really helped. So thank you. I'm glad. I'm really glad. You're welcome. Um, yeah, it was amazing. I want to, uh, I, I want to, uh, trade something for your, for the little snowman that you made today. Maybe we could uh, barter for you. You know what? If the little snowman survives, um, the, if he, whoop, hey, guess what? The little snowman's oh. still hot. Oh. Uh, <laughs> if he survives, then you can have it. It's yours. Oh, oh no, I don't I have a question. Is that your kiln beside you? Yes. Yeah. And can you tell that it's had some serious use because it's melted the paint right off it? How, how much does something like that run? We have a kiln. I don't know. Because <laughs> that's... You have a that is probably 15 years old. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't even tell you, I don't know. And there are kilns and there are kilns. And you can, if right. you're lucky though, you can get a kiln secondhand. A lot Absolutely. of times, Lampert beaters, they upgrade because <laughs> they need it. And uh, you might be lucky enough to get one that's much more economical. I got mine for a hundred. Oh, I did not, I did not get mine that, that affordably. Um, but Paragon kilns, if you do want a kiln and and you're looking for one that is going to be reliable and easy to use, Paragon kilns are fantastic. And how do you use it with your beads? Uh, so the way, so this is specifically a bead kiln. It takes about an hour, an hour 15 to ramp which means that there's different settings that you can, different programs that you can create. So the program that I use gives me about four hours of working time. That's about all I can work at the torch uh, comfortably. So it takes about an hour and 10 to, to ramp it up. So what happens is I come out into the shop, I'll turn it on, I'll get everything ready, and then I'll go have a cup of coffee, whatever, come back. And all that happens is the same process that you happened here, that you saw here. And instead of putting the beads into the annealing bubbles, yeah. this thing, instead of putting them in there, I just put them in here. And I, I don't know why, but I always start at the left-hand side and I work over and I just, I open the door as, as little as I can, shove the mandrel in there and then close the door as quickly as I can so that it doesn't lose too, too much heat while while we're feeding it and is it faster to use a kiln than the beads no no um so most most lamp workers that, that sell their beads or or are artists will use the kiln so that they can professionally anneal their beads. They know that it's in a controlled environment they know that it takes 12 hours to get through the program they know for sure that no stress is going to be left in that glass when it comes out. So the difference with the kiln is that it's extremely structured. It's very controlled. With the annealing beads, it depends on how many mandrels that you put in there and how much heat that you're introducing and the temperature of the ambient room that you're in. And there, it's much less controllable. It still works fine. Anything that you make that might be over an inch, though, should definitely be kiln annealed, whereas any spacers and small things that you plan on making should go into the, can go easily into your annealing beads or your vermiculite or your fiber blanket. Don't you tend to use the beads to hold them while you put them in the kiln? I 
I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I Do could you... just talk. It would probably be easier. Sorry. Oh, um, so hey, so like I thought that the beads basically were like not everybody had their kiln going all the time or sometimes you had to use a friend's kiln. So you use the annealing beads so that they cool down slowly, less likely to crack, and then you can take them to a kiln and, and anneal them, kiln anneal them after the fact? Yeah, so we call that batch annealing. Yeah. Um, and really all that means is that exactly like Her Excellency said, you've put everything into your annealing product. You've let them cool down. They've come down to, to room temperature. Um, at that point, you can take them off the mandrels or you can leave them on the mandrels and you can take them to someone who's got a kiln and have them have them batch annealed. And all that means is that those beads then go into the kiln cold. The kiln is turned on and ramped up slowly. Those beads then go through that entire program and come back down to room temperature. So this, sorry, there's a, uh, it's the same process. That was amusing. Where you're still removing this, pardon? That was amusing. Sorry, there's, a, there's bugs. I don't like bugs. Um, same process. Uh, one extra step. That's it. But you're right. You absolutely can use the annealing beads for that. Well, I'm on my way, but thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. If you batch anneal, do you leave the beads on the mandrel? to put them into the kiln after you've... You can. Yeah, a lot of people do it that way. Um, I, I also know a lot of people who just take the beads right off. Um, and generally what happens is you'll only have a certain amount of mandrels. So let's say you have 20 mandrels and you've made all of your, you've made beads on all of your mandrels. So you have 20 beads that need to be annealed. So you, you put those into your annealing beads, you let them cool, take them off, make another 20, take those ones off, make another 20. You can go then and batch kneel all 60 of those beads at one point. Okay. And still be producing while those ones are annealing. Cool. Bicycle spokes. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of mandrels, you had mentioned um, when you first started out, <laughs> um, heating up the mandrel till it glowed a little bit before you put the, the glass on it. If you have the bead release on there, am I looking for the metal to glow or the bead release to glow or am I overthinking it or? Well, you're overthinking it a little bit because what will happen is you'll see the metal, the mandrel glow through the bead release. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. This is all so much easier when you actually get to do it. I swear, if you were all here, I could teach you how to do this in five minutes. Six, if there's a mosquito, five minutes, because it's so easy hands on. So easy, easy enough, actually, that I've seen people who know what they're doing and have enough safety precautions do it in five year olds. Oh, yeah. So I'm I'm not keen to teach a class of five year olds. I have taught small, small humans. Didn't say a class of them. Okay. One-on-one. <laughs> because -on -one. <laughs> I will, I'll teach a class of adults, no problem, as many, no, no concerns. Uh, little kids, one-on-one one -on -one for sure. Have you ever used uh, like recycled glass, busting up a bottle or not to, to combine different types of glass, but if you're going to use a single type of glass, Will something like that work, or is it? Do you have to use the pre-made rod? No. So one of the one of the prettiest glasses that you can recycle uh, is those Bombay Sapphire bottles. Yeah. I don't drink, so I have to. I have to get them from my friends when they drink. But that blue color is incredible. So wash it. Yeah, it has to be clean. And if you smash it very carefully, you can then take those shards and make beads exactly like I showed you, but you have to have something that can hold that glass while you're heating it up. Um, and that's, that's where the hemostats really come in because you would just put that shard of glass into your hemostats and use that instead of holding it. 
and that particular color of glass and and uh, those bottles I know that a lot of artists that do slumping and that sort of thing they love those ones they're they're hard to get unless you happen to have a friend with a problem okay. Harvey's Bristol cream sherry I'm sorry Harvey's Bristol cream sherry that deep deep sapphire uh I'm gonna nod right now because I'm not familiar uh okay I'm, I'm not a big drinker, so I don't know these things. I just happened to come across the Bombay Sapphire thing because my best friend wants it. I was all like, hey, can I have your booze bottle when you're done? Just like, oh, uh, why? <laughs> Gonna smash it. So what's, what's the, you said, you mentioned you were working on a commission. What are you working on now? What's, what's the commission? um so, so when i was put on vigil for laurel um i decided that i would make myself a set of beads and because that like seemed like the thing to do so i had i had made myself a couple of festoons these ones as a matter of fact <laughs> um and they hang on my shop wall because that way I get to see them every time I'm out here. And I happened to have a friend who had come in and come over and was like, oh, my stars. Now this person has nothing to do with the SCA, knows nothing about it is, I kill you, sorry, um, is actually a tattoo artist in Vancouver. And he was just, he was quite enamored. And I was, he said, you make me some. And I'm like, okay, weirdo. I don't know what you're gonna do with them, but okay. Uh, so I've gone ahead and I've made him a set uh, similar to mine, but not the same because the, my, the design for that is special to me. Uh, so it's similar and I just, I have to string them now and I, I guess I'm going to string them sort of like a necklace and I don't know what he's going to do with them. Did you cover um, ventilation? Yes. Okay. I was on the phone for some of it. My sister called, so I must have missed that. What do you use where you are for ventilation? I have a, an aviation and aeronautics fan okay. in my little studio. Uh, but previous to that, I had, um, I've had really bad setups, like even just a fan in the window that pulled fresh air in the window that went across where I was working and then a fan yeah. in the other window to suck it out. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't ideal, but honestly, you really do need to have good ventilation. Oh, you yeah. cannot work in a room that's not ventilated. Please don't do that. You'll hurt yourselves. So is yours vented directly to an outside, like outside wall type thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's pretty good now. So is this where you are now? Is this a shop that you've built? on the property? Uh, yeah, you know what, I, I think I have enough battery left, I'll show you. So my husband is a bit crazy and I was bemoaning the fact that I couldn't work in the house anymore because we have someone in our basement suite now. So a year ago, he decided that it would be really, really good to build me somewhere to, to work. Um, Wow. What I this is what I call the palace. And um, that's, that's where I work. That's amazing. So if you all happen to be in the Okanagan, and you want to spend some time hanging out, um, let me know. I, it's it's a little bit small. So I can't fit a ton of people in there. But um, I'd be more than happy to host you. Oh, and you know what, it's much cooler out here. So I'm gonna sit out here. <laughs> Woo! So do we have more questions? This is so much fun. Or at least I'm having fun. Sorry. I'm, I'm having a little fun. More away. I think it looked incredible. I am um, oh. so blessed. You, but you've done a few you interesting things. Like you built an outdoor kiln at one point, didn't you? I did. Yeah, how, it, how involved did that go? Of, uh, it involved a lot of poo and clay and some hay um and it was actually a lot of fun 
I, I did make period beads on period mandrels in it. Uh, it, it takes forever. So, you know, when you see, like, when you see small Norse or period beads, um, stupid birds, um, they're small for a reason. So when you see the bigger ones, like the, the saddle weights and the sword pommel beads, those things would have been worth gold because they would have taken forever. But it's so fun. It, it does smell a little bit bad because you've got hot charcoal coals burning in something that's made from muck. But it, it was so worth it. So worth it. Really? Yeah. Whereabouts in the Okanagan are you? What? I'm in Kelowna. The noises of the... Uh the forest here it's very loud it's quite funny yeah my cat my cat has just that one right there that cat nope not that cat the other cat the other cat is a bit of a dingus and has decided that one of the magpies uh looked like breakfast and i, I don't think he got it but what he's done is he's irritated every magpie in the neighborhood and they come over and they pick on him now great like crows they don't forget yeah if they could like leave me some shiny trinkets i'd be okay with it then i'd be okay with putting up with them but yeah. i digress yeah. hey george i think at this stage why don't we why don't we call it because you've now been on the hot seat for two hours but if people want to keep like a social informal thing going or whatever we want to do but I just I don't want you to feel like you have to still be on because you've been on for quite a while so I just want to kind of check in with you um yeah you know I I'm I'm good you're more than welcome to contact me on Facebook if you have questions or if you have concerns or you just want to chat I'm good like I said if you happen to be in the area and want to spend an afternoon and give it a go let me know because I'm happy to do that too I'm happy to have people by uh, of course, this is all dependent on social distancing and all that sort of thing. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Excellency. This has been amazing. Thank you, Your Grace. Thanks, everybody. I had a really nice time. And I haven't taught in a long time, and I've never taught online. So y'all were very patient, and I appreciate that. Awesome. We'll get the link to you so you can post it to your local group, too, when it's available. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.